Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to Monday's edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Info, brought to you by Options House. Joe, how was your trip up north this weekend? You know what? Sadly, I have to report that our uh, trip was canceled uh, for the weekend. We didn't wind up going up to Petoskey, thanks in large part due to the weather. It's oh. another cold one out there, Joel. We got snow, we got winds, we've got wind chill in in territory that i haven't seen and since i can't remember when <laughs> and uh i think i'm coming down with something thanks I in know. part to people that come to oh no sick. don't get a sick Jason job Raznick, i'm looking in your direction but so it might be an early day for me yeah yeah i i can hear you man just an early day to get home but uh the markets are warming up a little bit here, Dennis. Uh, Must be not, using a space heater or I something. Get, yeah, I guess we had the uh, the two-day move uh, Thursday and Friday, but uh, things are looking a little better this morning uh, due, due to the cat, huh? Well, that's helping, but we were even uh, higher actually overnight before the cat came out. We were trading down right off the bat when we opened at 6 o'clock Sunday night. We traded down to 1776 and a quarter, and it looked like it was going to open obviously a little bit weaker. And we slowly started to gain momentum to buy the dip crowd coming back in here once again here overnight. We've traded as high as 1792. We pulled back a little bit, trading up 675 right now at 178875. Yeah, I was talking with uh, Shaky Jake uh, near the close yesterday after you know after the four o'clock, and he's we were discussing you know what you know what do you think you think we can you know get a bounce on Monday, and I just said, man, I just don't think the low's in yet. You know, I think the low right then was like around seventeen eighty four, and uh, I think by the time I got home and turned my computer on, it already had washed out, got down to seventeen eighty one here, so. Uh, what happened in that last hour and a half? The market really came apart. Yeah, well, what typically happens, and actually I was talking to another guy, typically when you see the market trading down 20 S&P points at 2 o'clock, and you got two hours still to the open, the market will typically get weaker. That is because you have to have a lot of rebalancing going on. First, you have a lot of people calling up saying, I want out. So there's going to be a lot of institutions probably selling stock on the close because they're seeing the weakness. And, you know, a lot of mutual fund sales happen on the close. So you have those guys. You also have the leveraged ETFs that have to rebalance. On the big down days, they have to sell more to get themselves not as levered. They're always adjusting every day. Um, they, and they have to rebalance as well. So you, you have predictable selling pressure when you're down that much. So and what happened was we were trading around 2 o'clock. We were trading around 1799 and we fell off another 15 points after that in the last two hours so it really started to cascade the selling was very broad based i'm telling you this was across the board you even saw the miners taking it on the chin they were strong early in the session and they got weak too and actually a lot of them closed down as well so even with the market being down you know they were even selling some of the defensive assets it was selling across the board and that's the first time we've seen this this year all right, so now now we got we made the low overnight, made a 1776 low, and we're getting a nice bounce here. So do you think some people, you know, do you think that was it? That was the correction. Now we're just going to turn around and go back up to that 1840 level, or going to take a day or two to settle in here? Well, I think you're going to have a lot of information off the bat. And sometimes it's actually a bad thing for the market to open higher after a big run like that because you get people that are itchy and they want to get out and they'll use that opportunity to get out. So sometimes, you know, you like to see it actually after a big two-day sell-off, open a little weaker, and then the buy the dip crowd comes in. But now you're going to have the sell, the you know, rally here a little bit crowd coming in, the people that are underwater here looking to lighten up their positions. So I don't know if I do believe that the low is in. Uh, maybe we'll get a quieter day here, but I doubt it. I think if they take out the low and keep that number in mind, 1776 and a quarter, we're 12 points above there right now. But if we start cascading down and take that out, it could get real ugly. The bulls need to defend that low there. I don't think they're going to come right back and buy this thing up 20 points here, though. I don't think that's going to happen here today. But, um, you know, we've seen funnier things happen, too. Like last time when they had the big sell off to 25 points, they came and bought it right back the next day. That didn't happen on Friday. Does it happen on Monday? I don't think so. I think you got some people nervous this time. Uh, yeah, Fari was talking about that, that anomaly. And that's when we uh, dipped under 1820, uh, like the only two times, I believe, in early January. 
Uh, but we were talking at the, at, the, at the beginning of last week how this consolidation here between you know the 18, 17, 50, and then the all-time highs up near 1846. I mean, the market just can't sit there for six, seven, eight days and not you know and not make a move one way or another. So it did break out to the downside here. You don't have a lot of resistance coming back. Maybe uh, you know 1800 be a psychological level, but uh, you got to get back above these lows that you had at uh, 1809. 75 and 18, 12 and a half. And uh, when we finally make a bottom here, we'll try and figure out a 50% retracement. But uh, things could definitely thicken up in the 18 handle. And you were talking about, the, you know, uh, the gold miners selling off, but gold really didn't sell off. Yeah, and typically you will see gold rally, obviously, on days where the market's down 40 points. So gold held up, but the miners themselves, like I was saying, they did actually, they were still buying gold, but they were selling the miners, and the miners were not participating with the gold rally on Friday. It participated off the bat in the first 20 minutes, but after that, and, you know, and I actually started shorting the miners, I thought, well, I thought it was overdone. I shorted them all off the open, though, and I actually got caught in the wash out there. They kept buying them up. So I shorted a little bit of Barrick. I shorted a little bit of Newmont. I even sh was shorting in the silver. I shorted silver Wheaton, SLW off the hop. And Barrick rallied like 30 cents on me in, in literally like 25 seconds. It was ridiculous. And it just kept rallying. I was like, uh, so as they pulled in and as they were coming back down, I was covering my shorts and took off Barrick for a short, small loss. And I was able to scratch the Newmont. And the SLW, I think I actually might have even made a small gain. But if I would have held those things for another two hours, I would have just cleaned up. So I was kicking myself for, uh, you know, calling it. But I was too early. And it's all timing. The market is all timing. And my timing was just a little bit too early there. Um, uh, Morganomics is uh, popping in here. You know, is it time to start taking a look at the VIX? Uh, you know, that's a lot. Of, I know that's not a trading vehicle that we use a lot, but, uh, you know, just had a lot, you know, probably an area of, you know, consolidation here. Well, now let's go to the dailies to take a look at it. Do you think that, I don't know if I'd be buying that, I'd be buying that VIX today. I think, wouldn't you want to uh, let the market just settle for a couple days and then, and maybe do it, take uh, some of that juice on it? I know, I know some people are, you know, just banking on it to really ramp up here, but the way things are going, it looks like they're just going to take some air out of it today, don't you think? Well, when we start to rally, they always take air out of it. And you do see a pop, and it, you know, and it was a huge pop here for it over the last couple of days, as obviously the volatility has just spiked here in fear. It's a fear index, and fear has come back into the market here, at least short term, too. So. I don't know if I'd come in just fading right away. Maybe wait till you know you start seeing you know an actual market. Today's going to be a big tell. Today's going to be a big tell. If we can stay up in the overall S P futures and hold the low from overnight, which is 1776 and a quarter, hold the close 1782, and you're going to be able to tell this pretty much off the bat. If they come in at you know where we open up seven points at 9:30, and if they come in and they bash this thing down to settlement in the first 10 minutes, and then start bashing it lower. Then, you know, it's obviously very concerning. But if they come in and they steady it, and that's what they need to do. I don't think they're going to come be able to come back and just buy this thing up and we're going to rally 30 S&P points here today. But I think they need to come in and steady the ship, come in and hopefully <laughs> not have a huge down day here or not have follow through. If we can just have an inside day where we kind of consolidate for a bit, maybe we can start to climb back. And then maybe the buy the dip crowd will jump back in here again. But I think there is fear out there right now, and that's why you're seeing the VIX pop. Right, Dave, but uh, but you do have you do have some good news on the earnings front. That's what the market. We do have it. good news. Yes, we do, Joel Caterpillar. Holy cow! It is popping big time here this morning. So Caterpillar is a nice catalyst here that could drive the market higher. It's driving deer higher as well. But Cat is trading up five and a half bucks right now at ninety one sixty four. It went out at eighty six seventeen. Overnight high I had it there. I think it's been ninety two and a half. It was just flying by my screen, but uh, it looks like about ninety-two and a half dollar fifty-four versus dollar twenty-eight. So beat on the wow. bottom line, fourteen point four billion versus thirteen point six four billion. So beat nicely on the top line as well, announcing a ten billion dollar buyback, raising full-year guidance up to five eighty-five. Estimates are at five seventy-eight. So there's a whole pile of good news for you in the cap. Uh, you know, we always talk about, you know, this, the sector shift and, you know, always finding something to buy, right? If you're selling yep. something, you got to buy something else. And here is the Caterpillar. 
uh, just a rotten day on Friday. You do see that pre-market high at 92.50. Uh, looking at the daily here, it's funny because you just go and you look, and then boom, you notice the high here. Uh, that they got one at 93.20. I don't know if we're going to see that today, but you had another high at 92.86. I just got to imagine after this kind of move here, this uh, five-day down move uh, where you lost six points, and now you're getting it back. I mean, I don't know if I could recommend, uh, you know, going out crazy and shorting this thing. But, man, if you got caught in any of that vacuum and the downdraft here, uh, you know, 92, we were trading that last Monday and then closed at 86. Boy, I got to You got to think some people would be taking some chips off the table here. Yeah, I think so, too. 517,000 shares have traded here, but it's going to open, it looks like, up and in the 91, 92 area, which is resistance from before. Look what Procter & Gamble did on Friday on their earnings if you want to see what can happen. Obviously, Procter & Gamble had a decent report. It popped. It opened up, and on the big down day, we opened up around 79.10 and kept rallying all the way up another $2, got as high as 81.70. And then just started cascading down and cascading down all afternoon with the overall market. And by the end of the day, it had almost given back the entire gain. So if you look at that on the chart, you see that one little bar up there, the huge spike, and it gave it all back. Now, I don't think Cat, this is a pretty good report, lots of good news here. I don't think Cat's going to give it all back here. Obviously, we had the market pushing Procter & Gamble down as well. But people were ready to sell, and it came in a resistance area, and people were there to sell the stock on Procter & Gamble. And they might be willing to sell a little bit and take a few chips off in the 91, 50, 92 area, especially if it gets up there into the highs. If it gets up anywhere up that 93, 20. I think there's going to be people lining up. How did you play that Procter Gamble? Because I knew you were you got short at what 78, 80, 79, something like uh, that. After hours, and sometimes I do stuff like this if they give me a lead. Somebody was bidding it up. Obviously, somebody knew something. But <laughs> Mr. They were Proctor. bidding it up. This was Thursday night. They were bidding it up in the after hours, and I had closed at 78, I think 22, if I'm remembering right. And somebody's bidding up, and I and they were bidding for 5,000 shares up there, 78, 88. And that's giving me a 60 cent lead. And I was like, eh, I'll try a little bit. So I was short a little bit. I took it into the report. Um, the stock actually did go down for me. I was able to cover some at $78 pre-market. I didn't get the whole thing covered, though. I kept a little bit on. And the stock I kept okay. on, I think I got covered in the pre-market uh, before it had actually opened at 78.80 or something, wow. I think I covered. So I actually was able to make on majority of that trade. Um, obviously, if I would have held it, it would have just killed me. I mean, the stock went all the way up to the 81.70. I would have shaken out. There's no way I'm holding Procter Gamble. Two and a half bucks. Uh, you know, it's all about risk. You know, management there. There's no way I would ever hold Procter Gamble two and a half bucks against me. So I'm glad I got covered. Uh, but it pulled back in. I wish I would have, you know, had the guts to short it up there when I made that spike up to 81.70. Obviously, hindsight's 2020, but there was a lot of tops up there in that mid 81s. Uh, so do you think there's any stock in the book that's going to hold the cat down off the open here? I mean, you're cutting through a lot of sellers there. I mean, can you imagine after the decline that it had, you know, the amount of stock at a number like 90? Yeah, you know, 90 probably going to be big. 80 and a half, 89, 90. Book. I mean, it's come four, on. It's four points up in the book, so it doesn't even it only shows you like 15, 20 levels in the New York book there. So I can't see that far in the book at the 90, but I'd imagine there's something there. And we're starting to give it back. We're up at 92 and a half. We're now at 91 and a half. This is just a big spike, and we're not obviously trying to tie you into coming here and fade this thing or not. But I definitely wouldn't be coming in here and buying it either. It's just you're chasing it too far. And if you're chasing the Procter Gamble, if you're chasing these earnings, you usually do get a shot. Let's look at Deer here too, Joel, because Deer is getting a pop here too, and it's a pretty decent pop. It just ticked up to $88, which is would put up $2.5. Obviously, we know Deer moves, but wow, that's a big pop for that stock too. It's back down here at $87.20. So, um, which is up a dollar seventy. So, Deer's getting a nice lift here too on these cat earnings. Yeah, I mean it's a sympathy play. I just I couldn't. I, I mean I'd have a you know I guess it would be easier to buy this stock up two and a half than it would be you know Caterpillar you know up uh, you know five and a half six bucks. I mean you just did get the trade in the eighty seven handle. I mean haven't even got the Fridays high yet here. So you got to imagine some people eighty uh, eighty six eighty seven sixty seven trading right there so it's still opening uh into resistance and the other thing about these stocks too is uh they if you go a little bit longer term they really did not participate in uh in 2013 now they were no, they good, did yeah not. look at this look at this period of consolidation here in 2013 for uh 
for dear here between, I mean, it didn't quite get to 80, but, man, it had spent almost the whole year between 80 and 85. You got the breakout here. I think if I w wanted to get this thing longer term, kind of hope it would come back down to these old tops because now that's going to be good support. I wonder if you can use some weakness in the market. If we do get continued weakness in the market here over the next few days, um, if it's a further washout, I wonder if you will get another shot at some of these things in the lower you know, or mid-80s here because obviously Caterpillar had great support. And I was actually looking at this one more for my portfolio. I was thinking if this thing got back down to the $84 area, it's been great support. It's consolidated for a long time. Some pretty decent value down there. I mean, the thing's got a decent dividend at 2.79% too when you're at $86. So... If it's pulled back down to 84, 82, the dividend yield would be even higher. Now we're popping, and so now it's off my radar for an investment here. But I wonder if it, you know, if we do get some weakness here, if we can pull back in those mid 80s, I wonder, um, you know, if we're going to get another shot. Uh, talking about this uh, sector rotation and, you know, the money always trying to find a home here, uh, Morganomics uh, has been getting some of these uh, defense contractors to work for them and work for him. And uh, let's just take a look at uh, some of these. Uh, one of them is uh, General Dynamics. Now, I, th I think that that did not have great earnings, but it did rally still, didn't it? Um, I, you know, my goldfish memory, Joel. Okay. I, had to coach, I can go to the Benzinga Pro here, though, and I can find out what the earnings report actually was when I had the big pop there three days ago. They reported... Earnings of a dollar seventy six versus a dollar seventy five, so they beat by a penny. The guy, the guidance was actually a little bit light. So yeah, interesting enough that it did pop after uh, the guidance that they saw for uh, the full year. They were saying six eighty to six eighty five. Analyst estimates were up at seven twenty four. So um, you would think that the market would get a little bit weaker on that, but it didn't. It popped up and got over the hundred dollar area, and now obviously pulling back here a little bit. But uh, the charts, that's a nice looking chart. If it pulls back into the ninety five area, great support down there. We're still three dollars higher than that, though. Yeah, having a little problems with my chart here on it. Um, the other one that he was taking a look at uh, was uh, Textron, and uh, that did get a pop up over the thirty-eight dollar, got to thirty-nine twenty-four. Uh, but now it's uh, sneaking back uh, into a really good support. You're at near Friday's low at thirty-six thirty-one. That was the close. Kind of trading unchanged here. Had a lot of tops at 36 here, so uh, little maybe a little pullback here in uh, Textron. It uh, maybe get some bids there at the 36 dollar level. We found support there in late December, multiple lows in the 36 area. We did take it out earlier though in January, and we went all the way down to 34.68. Then we popped, obviously back. But if you think we found support there in late December, maybe we find some support there again. So 36 might be an area where I'd maybe try to pick a bottom. We'll see. Yeah. Obviously, all depends on what that market's going to do. Yeah, there. same with Raytheon here. Um, had it just got walloped over the last two sessions, but uh, now coming back into the $88 level, did have a low at 87.66 on the 7th, and then you got near the uh, the $88 level in Friday's trading. So uh, despite the pops, these stocks are coming back to support here. So it'll be interesting if uh, they can hold their own. And then uh, – the last one here we'll take a look at is our old favorite uh, Honeywell here. And uh, once again, that stock got up to 91 in, fri in Friday's trading, got to yeah, 99. Reported. Yeah, then came all the way back. Wow, this $88 level is sticking out like a sore thumb here. Closed right on the low Friday uh, at 88.47, 88.43. You had your low at 88.12 going back on the 14th. And then also another low, just under 88 uh, at 8797 back in December. So uh, been the bottom of the range here at 88. We'll see if Honeywell can hold hold that support. Not getting a though, not really getting a pop though, right? Or is it bit up, Dennis? I'm just looking. No, nah, it's not bit up here. Uh, but I'd imagine best offers up at 89.33, and we're pretty early here yet. A stock like Honeywell doesn't typically trade much in the pre-market unless it does report earnings. So I'd imagine it's still going to open higher when the S&P futures are up eight points here. So interesting enough, you cite that 88.12 low, and somebody actually bidding 88.12 on the nose for 300 shares. There's a guy ahead of him at 88.13 for 200 shares, but that's probably just a bot. Whenever you're in the pre-market there and you put a bid, usually there's an automatic pennying program that will step ahead of you by a penny. So I think that 88.13 is probably just a bot stepping ahead of the real guy who's sitting there for 300 shares at 88.12. That's banking on that lower level um, from 
where was that low that day? 88.12 from the fourth, or from the 14th of January. He's banking that that low is going to hold, so he's sitting out there trying to bid too. But I'd imagine it opens a bit higher. I mean, also Pretty too, early. when you come in, the S and P's are trading up this much, and you know you didn't cover short on the close, and you're like, oh man, everything's going to, yeah, yeah, everything's up a bit. I'm sure you know people are. Uh, you know, lamenting that you know, I was there. Big mo was there. Big moc sell orders on Friday. Do you yeah, know? there was Joel. There was a lot of moc sell orders, and we knew that coming in. Like it's predictable when the market's down that many points, is it's going to be some institutional selling pressure on the close, and that's exactly what happened. And you saw stocks like Honeywell basically go down, and and they had decent selling balances. It was all across the board. Everything pretty much was closing on the lows. You look at General Electric. You look at Honeywell. You can just pretty much bring up any chart, and almost all of them closed very near the lows. So it was a weak close and predictable weak close with the market down that much. Let's uh, move on. A couple upgrades and downgrades I just want to quickly cite here, and then we're going to get into some of the Momo stocks. But first of all, Merck here this morning is getting upgraded at Morgan Stanley. And this is a stock that kind of had a decent day on Friday. We were talking about everything being weak. A few of the drug stocks were holding up, and Merck actually did close positive on Friday. Wow. Closed up pretty near the highs of 51.98, got as high as 52.17. But this is getting a big lift here on this Morgan Stanley upgrade here this morning. It's trading up at 53 bucks right now Ooh. which coincides closely yeah after the earnings was it earnings or what was the i think it was earnings i made a pop drug, it, it was a drug it was a drug wasn't it oh it was a drug yeah there yeah. let's go back and find out which we gotta wake brent up over here he's uh Where's brent? Hey, he's usually on brent. are you there us. brent come on now hey i'm a busy guy today what do you yeah, want yeah yeah let's go uh what do you this Merck here. What was that? Was Whoa. That, was that a drug? Oh, look at that. I'm totally like, you know, I, I need a whip. I can't, like, I'm not close. I got Darius in the middle, so I can't punch him. I need a, I need, I need a little bit of a whip here. I beat him uh, to it, Joel. I beat him to it. Okay. He sleeped on the job. Go back to sleep. Merck initiates rolling submission to FDA of U.S. <laughs> Biologics License Application for MK3475. Brent, explains what it mean? all. <laughs> yeah, what, what is MK3745, Brent? Come on now. Oh, MK3475? I know exactly that one. <laughs> um, actually, no, I don't. I, mean, I think I, I said 8675309 when, uh, the, the, when we were talking <laughs> about that before. Uh, hit a high on that day at 5344, then kind of pulled back, found great support at the $51 area. And now uh, with this pre-market pop, you're getting another shot at the 53 handle here. So... Uh, you know, once again, the pop in the S&Ps, a uh, little bit skeptical, getting a pop off the upgrade. This is probably uh, this is probably commensurate with the move in the S&Ps, right, Dennis? Yeah, it, it helps it a little bit there, but I wouldn't say the, the drug stocks really have a high correlation. It's not okay. like, you know, financial or anything like that. They're correlated, but not nearly as much as some of the other stocks are. It's probably mostly the Morgan Stanley upgrade that is giving this thing the pop. Pfizer here this morning actually is not popping up, and it was trading down earlier here. I'm just going to read you this here again from the Benzinga Pro. Pfizer announces their third phase three trial on NCICCTG BR26 did not meet its objectives. Oh, so, no. Well, also, another one didn't meet its objectives. <laughs> so a couple didn't meet its objectives, but we know how diversified Pfizer is here. So there's always, um, you know, if, when they have a drug that doesn't meet an object objective, it's not like a little biotech company that's a one-trick pony. Pfizer always has lots of tricks and lots of, stock, uh, lots of drugs that they're researching. So this is quite common. But the stock was trading down earlier in the pre-market. It's not now. It's trading at 3011. But interesting enough, when you look at this chart here at 30, that jumps out like a sore thumb on this one, doesn't it, Joel? Well, it's uh, it's a big stock. We, we talk about the big stocks, and we also talk about whole numbers. So a big stock at a whole number, 30. You had a low at 29.95 back on December 13th, and then buyers stepped up to 30.01 here. So it did get its dip under there. Wow, what a bad day on Friday. That's a big It move. was. Big, that's a big 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 old move for Pfizer, and if you look at oh, yeah. if you look what it did when it had that big down move uh, back in December, it followed it up with another one. Uh, but three straight days in a row coming off the 31 and a quarter level down to 30 bucks here. We'll see. I mean, there's got to be some bids in here, and uh, you know, uh, in the book, we'll see how if they get taken care of here. Uh, but this stock is this kind of this is kind of bucking the trend here of the rest of the drug stocks, huh? Yeah, because Lily was popping. I mean, everything was kind of weak. We always saw Merck a little bit stronger on Friday. But 30 is huge on Pfizer. But check out the chart on Lily. 
So Lily was had been popping up from 52 all the way to 55, consolidated for a few days in the whole 55 and a half area, and a couple days of a pullback here. So Lily pulling back a little bit there too, but uh, Lily chart, I don't mind that. You know, when you get that big move up and then you pull back, kind of like the 50% retracement of the move up on the overall market. And I wonder if you know they're going to defend this 54 area. Uh, well, you got the right, you know, the right sector here. I mean, you had the low on Friday right at the 54, right on the kisser, getting a little bit of pop up. I did see a straight print here under 54, 53.75 here. Uh, 53.59 was the low that you had on the 16. So coming in to support here, I'd really like to see it hold above this uh, 53.59 low and come back up but just the one thing that just a note of here is like you had that i remember you were talking about this look at look at lily look at lily you go 51 to 55 took a you know four five six training sessions and then you had basically four days of tight ranges mm -hmm. and that means you know the sellers and the buyers are starting to come to a little bit of an agreement there tight ranges people squaring off and then when you took out that low uh, from the bottom of the consolidation, which was 54.62, you did get the follow through on the downside. Let's analyze some of the aftermath from Friday's big sell-off, and let's go to some of the stocks that were really taking it on the chin. And it was some of the Momo stocks, but Google, holy cow, it took out that 1150 support area that had held for a few days, and it took it out, and it never looked back. It just kept selling the stock all day closed at 11.23.83 so ended up being down like 30 points on the day that's the biggest down move we've seen for google in a long time wasn't there a gmail outage too yeah Brent, was there a gmail yeah yeah we were getting reports internally a bunch of people ah, my gmail can't work and then we started seeing it hit uh other sources also so i don't know that was probably like uh Maybe like icing a on the cake two the two or three four hour yeah a little icing on the cake that's what i was gonna say uh, we were Popping back here about three bucks this morning, so Google is getting a little bit of life here. But what do you think of the technicals here? Joel? Well, it was already under pressure before, you know, with the market, and then that news hit. I believe it was Brett and I were analyzing the, you know, the when it hit the wires, and uh, I believe it was like right before two o'clock, and it was trading like at this uh, eleven thirty-five area, just kind of consolidating, and they got a nice whoosh out of it. You know, took it down three or four points and then, uh, you know, end up, it, it would basically go in sympathy with the market here. Uh, take a look at the low. You had a 11.17 low back on the 13th. You couldn't quite get there on Friday. I guess if you're still a Google bull here, you know, if you can get back down to the low in the close area, 11.23, 11.24, and you're willing to risk, you know, five, six points down to, you know, below this 1117 level, there's a good chance that, uh, you know, it could, it could drift back up. But uh, one thing I've known from, like, trading options and things on this stock, if it, you know, if it opens up green and it doesn't go red pretty soon, then it's going to stay green for the rest of the day. So uh, it'd be important to get the open. How is this in, um, uh, in relation, uh, you know, to how much the S&Ps are trading up. Is it pretty much uh, equivalent? or Very in line. Yeah, yeah, we're very in line here. We're up eight points right now. I didn't check fair value. I think fair value is actually up a couple of bucks there, too. So, yeah. So, anyways, um, Google's very close to in line here. Um, I would say probably $4 so would probably be fair value, 4 to 5 bucks for Google. So, you're right there. KKR, so, that makes sense. KK. Are by Sedgwick for two billion here. Morganomics is on his game here this morning, and uh, he says time to buy the big buyout firm KKR. Boy, we haven't looked at this chart in a long time. Twenty four dollars is just jumping on like a sore thumb. You bring up that level in October. We tried to break out through twenty four three four times, could not. In November, we tried to break out at the end of November three four times, could not. Took it out in December, and the old classic. O old resistance becomes new wow. support. We bottomed one, two, three, four, like five, six times throughout December in the 24 area. Then started to take off. Now we're coming back down here. 24, 23, the low on Friday. Got to think that 24 level is going to be big. Yeah, not real familiar with that uh, the, uh, the uh, stock or company that it took over. But, uh, boy, 24 bucks is huge. And uh, getting the mixed reaction here in the pre-market uh got a nice formation here between uh you know friday's low at 25 six or excuse me 
Thursday's low at 25.61, and then you cut right back Friday's high, a uh, little bit above that here, but uh, $26 level. Excuse me, what was Friday's high? Friday's high was, boom, let me click on that. 25.63. 25.63, and then you had the low at 25. 61 uh, from Thursday. Uh, so I don't you, think we're seeing that. You don't today. think you're going to see that today? Okay. No, I don't think so. The best bids at 24.11. Best offers up at 26.20. I'm looking at the buck. It looks thick up there in the higher 25s. I'm seeing some a little bit of size 24.98, a little bit of size 24.93. I don't think they're going to come in here and buy this thing right back up here. But I also do. I'm licking my chops a little bit there. If you want to try to pick them up, I hate picking bottoms. But I mean, that twenty-four dollar level really stands out, though, doesn't it, Joel? Yeah, I mean, uh, the the fact that it was old, you know, old resistance and came down to be new support here. So, uh, yeah, it looks like you need more of a chance to buy it there than you are to uh, to sell it up at that twenty-five and a half, twenty-five sixty level. We were just talking about the upgrades and downgrades a little bit. Let's just talk about a couple other ones just quickly before we get to the Momo stocks. Potash here is getting a pop. Our Raymond James is upgrading that stock here this morning. Look at this potash chart. It's been straight down for six straight days after breaking out and looking pretty good, making new highs over 35 bucks. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then a big washout day there on Friday with everything else. Got as low as 31.70, closed right near the lows. It's popping back 50 cents here. Do you think we've seen low there in potash? Oh, boy. I'm telling you, my, the gremlins are getting me on this here with the uh, POT. The here. gremlins are out Monday morning. Monday morning they don't like the potash. Like, yeah, I, the gremlins are speaking their opinion, and they don't like the potash. Where did you, you say it was traded at? <laughs> Well, it got all the way down to 31.74 on Friday. It's trading up at 32 and a quarter right now. So we're getting a 50 cent pop here on the upgrade from Raymond James. Uh, just going back on these stocks, they've never really recovered from uh, the, what was the cartel that said we're taking prices down. Remember that? Yeah, they all fell like 20 percent. If we go back down, that was back in the week of J August, uh, August 2013. That was the week of that, and when that's when Potash went from a 38 dollar stock down to a 31 dollar stock. They punished all of these things, saying obviously Potash prices might be falling here, and I think they said they might fall as much as 25 percent, which is not good and that's what knocked the stock down and they've been trying it's been trying potash been trying to come back some of these other ones it didn't hit agrium as hard but some of the other ones like mosaic mos it hit it pretty hard and all these stocks been trying to fight their way back here but they have not come back and recover that full loss from that day joel yeah. joel you're thinking of euro kelly Right? Oh, yeah. Does that sound right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. There's Brent with the save. Yeah, Brent, he's awake. Yeah. Brent's awake now. Here. Yeah, I think he just went and got <laughs> it's all little, over that. He got a little of his uh, Jumbo juice or something like that, his little special <laughs> potion he drinks in the morning. Now he's on top of it. Wake him up. But yeah, I, I mean, until you know that thing comes back down, I mean, I'd rather be trying to be patient by the thing on support than chasing it on an upgrade. Uh, let's move on to some of the Momo stocks here. Obviously, we talked about Google here already being weak. Facebook. Facebook made the new high there, and we talked about this just two days ago or three days ago where it had the f breakout became the fake out. It went up and took out that whole 59 area where it found resistance, got up as high as 59.31, and then closed the day weak. And on the show that day, we were talking about how that was a key reversal, that it did not follow through on that breakout. Next day, we opened down. Next day, obviously, with the overall market weaker there again, closing near the lows of 54.45. Now we're back up here at this whole 55 level it seems like we can never get away from facebook 55 it just seems like it's the number what's your thoughts here joel uh 54 is a great area uh, right near the close uh you had a low at 54.40 54.45 uh you go back you had another low um in the issue at 54.05 on january 6 and then earlier in january here so don't know if i'd uh, chase it up here at 55 but if it's starting to come back into the low Low 54s. I mean, you've had a nice training range. You know, we went up from the $58 level late December, came down to 54, held for a couple of days, went back up to the 58. Had a nice fake out. I remember you on that day. You're like, this is going, this thing's going to 60. It did take out all those sellers at 58.80 and 58.90 and the whole number 59. But uh, this was the one that if, you know, if you were shorting it to 59 on the way up, probably wasn't so good for you but if you waited till they came back down through it uh, you probably took no heat here uh, coming back on the upside air day on friday between 54 and 56 and change so uh you know i'd wait uh if you're looking uh, to initiate a short or take off a long got a long ways to go though to get to 56 42 
that was Friday's high. You know what chart is interesting here is the Twitter chart. It did not really sell off that much on Friday with the overall weakness. And look at the setup. I know we're not big pattern traders here, but it's not looking like a cup and handle forming on Twitter here. And if this thing can stay above that whole 6088 low that it made on Thursday, this thing could start to get interesting here. I think it could be a decent day for Twitter here eventually. And uh, we're getting close to its, its first earnings announcement, too. So I know that's coming up uh, within a week or so. Wow, tight ranges in that. Even on, yeah. Yeah, even on, even on Friday, they really couldn't uh, whack it that much. But, uh, boy, you have not seen that, you know, for like the last 10, 12 trading sessions. This thing has just been been quiet here so you're looking trading up uh, a little bit in the pre-market here it's kind of like uh now you kind of look like you're before you were in a 55 to 60 range and now it looks like you're trading like a 60 to 65 trading range for twitter yeah, I think if we can start getting above and start taking out the high, well, I guess we got up to 64, 69 five days ago. So I guess you're right. We're still kind of a ways off from where it would start being in breakout mode here again. But I don't mind that chart. As long as the stock stays above 60, I think that you can make an argument from the bull case here still on Twitter, despite the crazy valuation. Right. Let's look also here Tesla. It was a little bit weak there on Friday, but held up not bad. So some of these stocks, interesting enough, some of the big guns held up not bad in the market, um, and obviously the big market sell-off there on Friday. And Tesla here tried to put in a double bottom from Thursday. Got as low as 173.42 on Thursday, and on Friday got as low as 173.53. I'm going to call that area a double bottom. As long as that holds here, Maybe we can see that 180 level again for the third or fourth time here. Yeah, this thing came back within 15 points all-time highs, right? Got, it's been uh, good, yeah. Yeah, it's been yeah this moving. came back. Boy, I sure wish I had those weekly 130 calls, but uh, that's what you get for playing the weeklies here. Uh, maybe uh, for this one, I'd like to see a couple. You do have a double bottom here, and you are trading right at that level. I'd like to see a, for this one, of course, because the chart's going up, I'd like to see another you know, couple days of consolidation here. And then a breakout through these low, you know, break down here through these lows at the 173.50 level, and then come back and uh, you know take back some of this uh, some of this move here, because basically 140 to 180 and one two three about six seven trading sessions, uh, that's a pretty good move here. And uh, but, but when these stocks aren't going down on a day the market's down 30, how many S&P points were we down on Friday? Wasn't like 35 points or something? Yeah. What were we down? On? When we're losing 35 points and you're looking at the Twitter and you're looking at the Tesla, these stocks are not going down on these types of days. And you know there's some overall uh, you know, people selling these stocks just from the macro perspective and the overall market selling off. Doesn't that tell you kind of that maybe these things want to go higher? That's what I'm reading off of these charts. Yeah, yeah, I'm just such a fader of everything. You know? <laughs> <I> <laughs> Something's know. going up. I gotta think it's going it's a down. Dark gotta, fader over there. <laughs> yeah, gotta get get uh, get rid of it. But uh, Brad, what's happening in RCL? Just before we go, we'll get to DJ stuff. But RCL popping here right RCL now. RCL popping here. Yeah, earnings just broke, didn't they there, Brent? Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean just out with Q4 results. Adjusted EPS 23 cents versus 18 cents. And it looks like they are boosting guidance fiscal year 14 EPS from a prior th around 306 to a new range of 320 to 340. The street is down around 317 for Royal Caribbean's fiscal year 14. Okay, so that would explain it, right? More good numbers coming out of the cruise line here. Uh, popped over 50 here, 50 and change. Quickly pulled back to the $49 level. So we'll keep an eye. 50 is a round number. Probably have some shares in the book there to sell. Uh, looking at the dailies, boom, Dennis. What do you see? A high of 50, 24. What do you What do you have for a pre-market high there? Da, 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 da. I'll go try to hunt it down here. It's flying by on my screen. I'll Already back in the 48, though. So, man, oh, man, oh, man. 50, you would... 17? Is that what just hit? Was 50, okay. 17? All right. Keep an eye on that level. 50, 17, pre-market and look at And look at, yeah, you're right. 50, 24 was the high on the 15th, and that is actually the high from the last. Oh, man, you got to go back. We're going back years here, actually. You know, look at this $50 level on this RCL. Because go back, if you go back to the chart, in uh, November of or in January of 2011, we had 49.99, dollars 
And then we're going back, obviously, five sessions ago and just took out the 50 at $50.24. And we popped out multiple days at 50. And then, obviously, we popped just in the pre market all the way up to that $50 area <laughs> again. Gave you one more shot only for a few minutes there, just while we were talking. We're already back down here at 48.70. So, major resistance seems to be pretty well defined in that RCL chart. CCL also popping here. We're up a buck in the Carnival Cruise Lines and Sympathy, obviously. It's trading up at 40.28 right now. So, keep an eye on that one, too, if you're trading these things. Uh, uh, yeah, people are uh, taking uh, taking to the cruise boats, huh? As uh, as opposed to the airlines, which have been flying lately. But uh, I'm trying to get my Carnival Cruise Line chart up here. I know uh, this is one of Jake's favorites uh, on the short side, but uh, we won't mention that. Uh, that is getting a pop up here. Uh, Carnival Cruise Lines. I'm not sure when they're due to report, but uh, RCL is gonna be the leader here. So we'll keep an eye on that. Let's look what we did. Oh boy, come on, computer, wake up here. Uh, up to 40.55, uh, but this thing's not really pulling back as much as the. I mean, it didn't have the big up move as RCL did, but. Uh, it's, RCL's popping back too. It's really chopping around right now because we just said like a minute ago it was 48.70. It's up at 49.24 now, so it's trying here again. But I think that 50 is big, man. I think the 50 level there is. Well, it's, it's absolutely crazy right now. This RCL church is moving around like crazy. Uh, you have um, a high forty ninety one from uh, Friday, or yeah, from Friday in the uh, the issue. So we'll keep an eye on that for CCL. Usually, you'd expect these sector plays to sort of be reporting around the same time. You get the financials at the same time. You get a lot of the education sack figures at the same time. For Carnival, I'm not seeing a report till beginning of March. So oh, it looks wow. like the, yeah, I was a little surprised by that. But just uh, to follow up with you there, Joel. Okay. DJ popping in the chat here. He says, G's been getting hammered over the last month, and he is absolutely right. This stock has been just getting annihilated. Four days ago, five days ago, we were trading 27 bucks. GE traded under $25. That's just an enormous move for a company the size of GE. It is getting a little bit of a pop here in the pre-markets. Back up at 25.10 after closing on the lows of 24.95. But what are your thoughts on this General Electric chart? Holy cow, it's a big move on Friday, too. Wow, well, I think you, this thing really will, before it's going to turn around here, you got to at least hold for some kind of like double bottom. Uh, yeah, G up, likes to do a double bottom, yeah, so we need that. Around, uh, you know, a whole number here. Uh, low on Friday, the close also twenty four ninety five, Getting a little pop up here. I think the best case scenario uh, for GE would be just to hang around this $25 level for for a little bit, and then uh, maybe if you get a, a market pop, it will take it back up. But I uh, don't think you need to rush out here and buy the uh, the twenty five tens or whatever to see if it can find it. And they had decent earnings Please. too, and uh, and and they took it down. So the street's kind of fickle. And then also uh, DJ uh, was talking about CVI here, and I'm I just remember that one did take out the forty dollar level. On, uh, on Friday, and it even did close back above it. I did not like that it had taken it out, traded all the way down to 39.60. As it turned, that was on Thursday, and yeah, then Friday got crushed. Right, yeah. right. Uh, let's see what happens at this $38 level. I uh, had a low at 38.15, uh, going back a few trading sessions ago, back in uh, December 17th, and then you hit this $38 level here. So like to see it hold, not getting much of a pop in the pre-market trading. So see if it holds 38, DJ. Hey, DJ, too, man. You can also short the thing. You just don't always have to be looking to buy it. If, you know, <laughs> well, right? Yeah. You, can, you got to be able to trade them both ways. I mean, obviously, some of my some of the best trades, I can remember, like, back in 2000, 2001, when you're in the bear markets, shorting the stocks, holy cow. It's all about market sentiment, really. I'm always biased, especially since we've been doing the show for the last few months. We've been in a bull market here, so I'm always biased on the long side, and Joel always calls me the eternal bull. But if you go back into like the, the financial crisis, and it's always about market sentiment, knowing which way the market really is moving and trending overall. That's usually the side that I'm trying to be biased towards and trading off of that side. And if the market ever starts to you know, start to get ugly here again, you got to be able to trade the short side, too. So you obviously need to be able to trade the long side and the short side. The last four or five years, it's just worked from the long side. But back in the financial crisis or go back into the tech bubble and you're trading on the short side, stocks go down a lot faster than they go up. And you can make money three times as fast when they're going down as they can going up if you're on the right side. So 
I don't know if I'd come out here and shorten the CBI though, because this has had a huge down move. Four points down in the last two Too days. I think I it's a little over. I think you're chasing now. If you're shorting that stock now, I think you're chasing. Yeah, you I are. think it might have been okay Friday or Thursday, but you're, you're chasing it now. Yeah, you like to see it, you know, come back in. And I mean, there was low at the, I mentioned 38.15, then you had another low that was quite a bit lower at. Uh, um, 37 so let's see if i mean this one's pretty stodgy too i mean look at all the highs that it you know made around uh, just above the 42 dollar level before it turned lower broke down came back up to the 42 dollar level you want to see that same kind of uh same kind of pattern on the downside before uh before trying to trying along you want to see an interesting chart bring up the morgan stanley one this okay so long, Dennis. So long, Dennis. What do you think he was going to say? He was going to say, <laughs> look at this Morgan Stanley chart here. And uh, he's going to, I bet you he's going to say he's looking to looking to buy it. I bet you they they had earnings that were pretty good. Uh, looking at Morgan Stanley here. Come on, Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley has been getting hammered since the earnings report, right? Yep. Yep, and it, and it was down. not it was not that bad either here. I see th a high of thirty three sixty on Tuesday, and now we're down under thirty fifty. It's a good little sell off we had there. Right, and uh, in five trading sessions here, coming back into that thirty dollar level here, uh, had a low at thirty oh four, uh, going back. Uh, in uh, early December, you came down to that level again, uh, getting a little bit of a pop here in the pre-market. But uh, see, if, I mean, nice sell-off here, coming back into support. I guess if uh, if you uh, you know are looking at this issue on the long side, uh, thirty dollars would be an area to take a look at it. You want to take a look at some of the other financials here? Okay, let's probably take... a good time to do that. Yep, uh, Goldman Sachs here. Uh, let's see, that thing also had uh, good earnings and has sold off uh, quite a bit here. That is coming into a support level as well. Not getting a bounce here at pre-market trading, though. That's that's a little bit concerning. I uh, had a low on Friday at 167.64 with a 67.22 low here. Only getting a little pop in the pre-market. I uh, had a low at 167. 167.60 back in mid-December here, so uh, looking to, for Goldman here, looking to hold in here this uh, 167 level, and uh, if not, uh, next major support level would be uh, 165. Let's take uh, a look at a couple stocks here from uh, Morganomics here. He's busy. Uh, he, I guess, all excited from that down day on Friday. <laughs> He's uh, in looking uh, looking at all the stocks on sale. Yeah, uh, B X Blackstone, right? Uh, is that the symbol on that? Trying, yeah, the Blackstone. Blackstone. So that's another, I guess. Uh, well, he was trading KKR, right? Yeah. Yep. Looking at these uh, leveraged uh, or these uh, private equity groups that uh, I remember Blackstone's made some pretty good calls in the market here. Let's see if we can get their chart up here and see what. They've been doing uh, as of late. Bad day on Friday, but uh, you know the same scenario. Uh, 33 on Thursday, 30 on Friday. Uh, that kind of had a little bit of a different close, though. That actually ended up rallying near the end of the day. Huh, that's strange. Got down under 30 bucks and uh, closed hmm. at 31.13 here. So someone obviously was looking at this uh, Inus $30 uh, support level. It did take that out, maybe, maybe caught some people short, and then uh, turned around. Nice strong close on that one. For uh, for Blackstone, I'd like to see uh, you know some follow through. We're trading down a little bit in the pre market, but I'd like to see it just to continue this move on the upside. You had a 31.40 high from Friday, and that coincides with uh, Thursday's low at 31.57. So need to see the follow through to that level. If not uh, longer term, that. $30 level has been a uh, great support. Looks like I'm Apollo back, had. Boys. Oh, hey, <laughs> hey, Dennis. We missed you. You guys are so mean to me. Just hang up on me. Oh, my gosh. Me. That is That's not what, what they happened do. at all. That's what they do. And like what I'm saying, so they just. Hang yeah. Up. <laughs> You're out. Joel, that, uh, that Apollo had a pretty much the exact opposite move on Friday. 
Yeah. Sold off into the close there. Right, sold off into the close, opened up near the low, uh, opened up near Thursday's low, which was 33.50, made a 33.43 high, and then took off. But this, again, coming into a little bit of support here, 32.20 was the low, and then you go back to uh, January 3rd, and you had the low at uh, 32.36. So a lot of these stocks just coming into support, Dennis, and that, that's what when, uh, when we lost you, you were talking about the Morgan Stanley coming back to the $30 level, right? Yeah, what what do you think of that? I mean, it, it sat a bad couple days, had decent earnings. I mean, you got to respect that support point. Uh, I think, um, and this is when levels seem to work the best. When you get like this macro movement, you get some big volatility and the stocks are trying to find a home and people are looking for, you know, well, where is this thing going? And they look at levels that jump out at them. So, I mean, you know, you can use levels in different times, but I think it uh, they actually work the best when you have that increase in volatility here. And, I, and we saw it on Friday. A lot of stocks go right to their support levels. So you want to respect those levels. And 3009 is a big number of Morgan Stanley. So keep that in mind and... You know, let's look at a few other ones here, and let's actually preview Apple because they're going to report here tonight, Joel. And we haven't talked about Apple yet. It's up four bucks here in the pre-market of five fifty. But interesting enough, look at the two ranges there from Thursday and Friday. They're almost identical. Actually, the stock on Thursday got as high as five fifty-six. On Friday, got up to five fifty-five. On Thursday got as low as 544, and on Friday, 544.75, actually within a nickel of each other, 544.80 and 544.75, two pretty much identical ranges for Apple. Very rare. Very, Very rare. rare. Going into uh, to earnings here. Um, this stock is interesting. Uh, Carl was at it again last week on Twitter and CNBC, and when he was talking on Wednesday, the stock had already made an interday high, I believe at like 557.26, something like that, 557.29. And when he was talking, they made a couple runs at it, and uh, they couldn't couldn't take it through. And then Thursday, he sent his letter out to the shareholders uh, you know, for the increased buyback. Still couldn't take it through that level again. And then Friday, you had the market weakness, right? So mm -hmm. that a little bit of a trivia. But it's winding up here for earnings. Uh, five, six, 530 to 560 is contained, you know, the range here for the last five trading sessions. And this kind of feel like it's just kind of, I kind of feel like it's running out of momentum up here. Well, it's all going to depend on what is in that report as well. Obviously, we've talked before, and you know, you've mentioned this before that I don't know what the long-term catalyst here. I don't know what the driver is. They need a product. They need something. You know, buyback just isn't maybe going to cut it. It's just maybe not going to be the thing to keep driving it higher here. They're expanding to China. I think they've milked the iPhone. It feel like for as much as they can milk it here, if they don't come out with something to do with that cash in the near future, they might start to whip this thing again. But I'm very interested in this report. So it's going to be a lot of information coming out for us after the close today to see which way they can take this thing. Spend some money in R&D instead of buying back stock, man. Come up with something new. <laughs> Let's take a look at the AT&T chart here. Uh, if you, We were just talking about different levels here, and I wanted to point out the whole $33 area. Um, actually, just above 33. We've made multiple lows in 33.15, 33.20. We we're popping back up a, a bit here on AT&T this morning. They are saying that they do not intend to make a bid for Vodafone. Vodafone VOD is actually trading down about a buck on that news right now. But AT&T getting a little lift off at 33.68. That goes to pull back. Man, you got some big support in the lower 33s. Yeah, that and that, what's interesting about this stock is that as bad as the market was on Friday, this thing didn't wasn't even able to get take out Thursday's low. It showed some nope. relative strength, 33.15. Uh, also had a low at 33.20, going back on the 21st, and uh, also a double bottom here. So yeah, you're right. You're getting a, quite a ways away from that now in the pre-market. But if uh, you know you settle back down, maybe you can get back. Uh, get back to the close uh just uh going back real quick to the ge here i signed jared's radar too uh you know the good support uh at the 24.93 level that was low trading slightly up in the pre-market and jared i mean uh, ge is just a kind of stock that will give you a couple shots at a level here i think 25 is the level now i mean obviously the big size there uh, I'd like to see it make another, maybe another low at 24.95 or 24.96, and then just uh, 
uh, just hang out around the $25 level. You notice when it came down to 26 and a half here, it made a double bottom. So um, it's had a real bad last couple days and real bad since it made that old, not all time high, but a multi year high at 28. So just uh, like to see it just hang around here at 25 a little bit more. What do you think, Dennis? Needs to put in a double bottom. So if it takes out the 2495, you start seeing 2490, 2485 go on this thing, it could start cascading down because there is some air below. We have a gap in the chart from 2468 all the way up to that 2509 area. So there is air below. And I wouldn't be surprised with this thing if it took out 2490. I'm going to give it, you know, if you say 24, we're in a decimal world, so you can't be right on the penny. But so it's going up down between before below 2490, 2485. Then I get nervous that it could cascade through the 24 handle. But as long as it holds, the whole 2490, 2495 low there from Friday. Potential to put in a double bottom and maybe you can try to take a shot. So, and that's what it is. Trading's all about. You can be put on any trade as long as you know where your out is. And that would be my out is if I'm picking a bottom on this thing, if I'm buying this thing up 15 cents, I'd probably wait. I'd like to probably pick up a little cheaper, maybe get a 2501, 2502, although it doesn't appear to be pulling back here at all in the pre market. Um, maybe you can get a shot there. But obviously, if it starts to take out and make new lows, that's when I think you got to go. What? Why? Why does this thing come off so hard off that twenty-eight dollar level? I mean, is it? You know, I mean, it really hasn't been, hasn't been analysts or anything beaten up on it. What do you think? It's just profit taking from, uh, you know, from the run up, or I mean, that's well. And it does trade with the financials. The correlation of GE in the overall market is very okay. high, but the correlation with the financials is very high. And GE does have a financial component to it, a large financial component as well. And if you look at the financials. J.P. Morgan has been getting slaughtered here for the last few days. Goldman Sachs, after their earnings, they're down like 12 points from their earnings report. We just looked at the Morgan Stanley. It's been getting beat up. Look at the Citigroup chart. That thing's down five points in the last seven trading sessions. So, I mean, the financials have been getting whipped, and GE does trade closely with the financials. So um, that's probably not helping the matter. And it's just uh, this post-earnings drip down here. I guess they really didn't like um, the earnings that they reported there from a week and a half ago, and they've just been drifting down, slowly selling it off. And uh, at the beginning of the year, it was the financials that were just kind of holding us up and uh, up in that uh, 1840 area. I know Bank America had good earnings, uh, spread into that multi-year high, 1742. It's come back now and filled the gap here, but Dennis, you gotta be licking your chops here at the 1650 area. That was a major area of support uh, before the earnings came up, and you got the pop over 17. Uh, once again, let's see what you got: 1645 low and close, but not getting a bounce here in the pre-market. Is it? Some of these stocks kind of in indicating that uh, the spoo rally is just not going to hold up. Well, let's go look at the imbalances here because a lot of times what you'll see is the opening imbalances which come out at 8.30, which was 27 minutes ago, will dictate what's going to happen here. And if I'm looking this morning, that's exactly what I'm seeing because I'm seeing GE. We're wondering why it's trading up. You know, you can look for news all you want and say, why is GE up 16 cents right now, which is a pretty decent move for the stock with Spoo's only being up six points. Well, GE's got a buy imbalance right now, 334,000 shares. So that's popping it up. You got Bank America with a sell imbalance of 261,000 shares. You got Morgan Stanley with a sell imbalance of 132,000 shares. So it's kind of mixed here right now with the buy imbalances, the opening buy imbalances, and the opening sell imbalances. And the financials, a few of these are starting to look a little bit weaker still, despite the market being up six and a half points. Now, these imbalances can change. This information is still going to be 32 minutes before these stocks open. So as more institutions come in to buy the stock on some of these, these things could go higher. But... Right now, if you know we were to open right now, these stocks obviously Bank of America, Morgan Stanley would open lower, and and GE would open significantly higher. Right, and uh, I mean, if you are just you know trying to, if you think that we just had that that island bottom there, and we're just going to rally up here, and you are trying things off the open, if they if they don't work right away, like off like if the lot some of these stocks don't you know if they trade you know ten depending on the 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 price of the stock, if they don't hold that the opening print or the opening five minute range pretty quickly then you know you may want to cut bait here and uh you know go back uh, and perhaps try it again here uh before we go with uh mighty joe young with the headlines here let's just take a look we've been talking about alcoa a lot lately and uh had that double top at uh 1231 1232 and then kind of got hit with the market here uh, yeah come back into this gap area 11 uh 53 high you gapped up 
Uh, you came right back into that area on Friday, 11:44, close here. So, I mean, it took it had that wallop off of you know off of the earnings, and it battled back from it now. Uh, now it's kind of retreating back from the $12 level, filled the gap. If this is if this is any kind of indication of the next move up here, I'd like to see it hold this uh, 1150 area for a day and then perhaps turn things around and go back up. Yeah, it was an ugly breakdown for Alcoa on Friday. It tried to hold $12 for a couple of days, could not, and then took it out and took it out with a vengeance there on Friday. Uh, open at and basically near the highs, 1191, could knock it up over 12 again. So 12 becomes major resistance here now. Stock pulled back, obviously, 50 cents, which is a huge down move for it. A lot of air here, though. I don't really I see that I, much I support agree. until you get down to 1103. So it's somewhat concerning to just kind of hang out. I guess you could try to, you know, lean on maybe Friday's low at 1140, but really not that much there. I like the $11 area a lot better than 1140 area. I think I might sit on my hands on this one. Uh, and uh, this one, it did give you three shots, uh, you know, at the $12 level. Uh, the uh, the bottom patterns are a little bit different. Uh, you know, here you kind of had the stair step here. So maybe if you do decline, you know, 11 quarter, 1130, and then you start to make these stair step lows here, might give you a little bit of a uh, little bit of an inkling here. Um, K A L U. Uh, let's see, is that um, is that technology stock? Another aluminum. No, that's another. That's oh, Kaiser it's another aluminum. aluminum. That's another aluminum play. Yeah. So and, and it it had a pretty wild range on Friday. I'm just looking at the trading range there. It got down. 68's been pretty big support for this KALU stock. Got down there three times earlier in the month. Got down to 68.31 on Friday. Closed a little bit off that at 69. Was as high as 71 dollars on Friday. 70.95. So it really had a pop there too before uh, obviously cascading down with the overall market in the afternoon. Yeah, I mean, this is a higher price aluminum stock here. So if you want to get a little more bang for the buck here, uh, this is coming into the $68 level. We had a, that one gave you a triple bottom down there at 68. So trading up a little bit in the pre market uh, off the low here. You dig it down to 68.32 on Friday. So that's 68, nice level. And uh, the last one from the financials, I believe this is uh, E-Trade. Uh, boy, we haven't looked at a chart of that in a long time, have we? You got a goldfish memory now. We looked at it on Friday. They reported earnings there on Friday. Or actually, it was on Thursday, I believe, the earnings report was. $0.20 cents versus $0.19. Cents, $447.1 million versus $425.8 million. Yeah, I remember all those numbers, too. You are <laughs> good. Really, but okay. <laughs> you're good, actually. I just read them off to Benzinga Pro. But anyways, they did report. And it had a wild range on Thursday when it reported earnings. Well, actually, that was, well, I guess Thursday was Thursday night. We're looking at because they reported Thursday night. So it was really pricing in on Friday morning was the real. Uh, you know, move from the earnings where it got up to as high as 2147, as low as 2054. We're popping here in the pre market 33 cents on each trade. I'm not sure if there's news this morning on that or not. I'm just trying to hunt down myself. I don't see anything. But, anyways, uh, we're getting right back up into where we had that resistance there again, this whole 21 and a half area. What's your thoughts on that? Ah, uh, having a hard time pulling it up on the chart, so I'm going to have to rely on your solid technical analysis here uh before we go to joe here uh let's just take a look at the s and p's uh the range nice range overnight 16 points 1792 has been the high 76 and a quarter uh the low that gives you a 10 and 6 right 16 point range eight points in the middle 1880 1784 that's the level you need the hole to go back should if it's really going to turn around, we should just go back up and knock out that uh, 1792 high. But uh, don't think that's going to happen. Coming back on the downside here, uh, you did get the washout down to 1776 and a quarter here. But you really got to look at the support point. Uh, Friday's low 1781 and a quarter, and the close 1781 and a half. So. Uh, Eight points or seven points away from that level. So we'll we are going. not seeing a lot of buy imbalances. I'm looking. I've got a, a pile of them on my screen right now. Really, all your top components of the S&P I keep on my screen all the time. And I can see the imbalances, and there's a lot of sell imbalances here today. And we're up seven points. Typically, on a day with seven points, we're usually all mostly buy imbalances. That would mean that all, most of the stock's going to open higher, unless something drastically changes here and we get some uh, big institutions coming in to actually buy some of these stocks. And I got the sell imbalances, and that might happen. 
um, this S&P future rally could not, might not hold up. So it's a little bit concerning that the equities are just not responding as well as the overall market. Okay. All right. Uh, let's shift gears here and go to mighty Joe Young with the morning headlines. Oh, thank you, Joel. Uh, today's editorial headlines from around the globe. Samsung has signed an agreement with Google to cross-license their patents, reducing the risk of costly legal disputes over intellectual property and likely fostering greater collaboration between the two tech giants. Seoul-based Samsung said Monday that the deal covers patents to be filed over the next 10 years as well as existing patents. Financial terms were not disclosed. Alan Lowe, Deputy General Counsel at Google, said in a statement that the deal allows the two to reduce the potential for litigation and to focus on innovation. Samsung said it also paves the way for deeper collaboration on research and development for Samsung and Google. The two already collaborate on smartphones and televisions. The announcement means there will be a higher possibility for Samsung to participate in Google's key projects as a hardware partner, said Chung Chang Wan, an analyst at Nomura Financial Investment Company. Google is to acquire the British artificial intelligence startup DeepMind for around $400 million, according to the technology news website Recode. Neither DeepMind nor Google were immediately available to, conf to confirm the acquisition or purchase price. DeepMind describes itself on its website as a cutting-edge artificial intelligence company. We combine the best techniques from the machine learning and systems neuroscience to build powerful general-purpose learning algorithms. Deep DeepMind was founded by Demis Hassabis, Shane Legg, and Mustafa Suleiman in an, and is based in London, according to the website. Late in 2013, Google acquired Boston Dynamics, another company that operates in the robotics field. Mountain View, California-based company, reached a $3.2 million deal to buy Nest, maker of digital thermostats and smoke alarms, earlier this month. The world's first multi-material full-color 3D printer has been launched by Stratasys the owner of the MakerBot range of printers. It features triple jetting technology that combines droplets of three base materials, reducing the need for separate print runs and painting. The company said that uh, Objet 500 Conix 3 color multi-material 3D printer would be a significant time saver for designers and manufacturers. Uh, the price is expected to be around $330,000. By incorporating traditional 2D printer color mixing uh, using, is it cayenne or cyan? It's that teal color. Magenta and yellow, the manufacturer says, multi-material objects can be printed in hundreds of colors. While the base materials are rubber and plastic, they can be combined and treated to create end products of widely varying flexibility and rigidity, transparency and opacity, the company said. Auto fans brave chilly weather, icy roads, and accidents to make it downtown to the final day of the 2014 North American International Auto Show, helping to push the overall attendance to a record 11-year high. Figures released Sunday night show 102,153 people attended the final day, bringing the eight-day attendance to 803,451. It is the first time the figure has exceeded 800,000 members since 2003, when 838,000 and 66 people attended, a spokesman said. The common lure throughout the week was the opportunity to view more than 550 new cars and trucks and concept models from big three automakers and other manufacturers under one roof before the vehicles are on the market. Promoters dubbed it the largest new car showroom in Michigan. Florida Representative Trey Radel, Riddell, Radel, We'll say Trey Radel, a first-term Republican <laughs> congressman who is convicted on cocaine possession charges, will resign from Congress on Monday. Uh, Radel's future in Congress has been in question following his guilty plea to misdemeanor cocaine possession after being arrested in Washington, D.C. in November and a subsequent leave of absence from his official duties to attend rehab. News of Radel's plans to resign was first reported by Politico and was confirmed by an aide to the congressman. Since the execution of Kim Jong-un's powerful uncle, Jang Song-thaek, last month, again, I'm sure I said that right, but I butcher these names every day, all his relatives, including children, have been murdered by the North Korean regime, according to South Korea's quasi-official news agency, Yonhap. The Yonhap uh, source said, some relatives were shot to death by pistol in front of other people if they resisted while being dragged out of their apartment homes. A further source told the agency the executions of Jang's relatives mean 
that no traces of him should be left. The purge of his people is underway to an extensive scale from relatives to low-level officials. However, it was claimed that a few of um, Jang's relatives by marriage, including the wife of the ambassador to Malaysia, were spared death and instead exiled to remote villages with all their own original family members. The timing of the murders remains unclear, but they follow Jang's execution after he was dragged out of a party meeting captured by an official photographer showing fellow cater caters looking down and aside apparently to avoid being seen to notice the shocking event. Wow. A little heavy, man. Monday morning. <laughs> A new study has found that therapeutic music process that includes writing song lyrics and producing videos helps adolescents and young adults undergoing cancer treatment gain coping skills. Joan E. Haas, a Ph.D. registered nurse, and Sherry L. Robb led a team that tested a music therapy intervention designed to improve resilience in such patients undergoing stem cell transplant treatments for cancer. Resilience is the process of positively adjusting to stressors, including those associated with a cancer diagnosis and treatment. The researcher's therapeutic music video intervention was designed to help adolescents and young adults explore and express thoughts and emotions about their disease and treatment that might otherwise go unspoken. And moving on to last night's Grammy news. Daft Punk didn't have to stay up all night to get lucky. Very punny. The helmet-clad French pop duo swept five categories on Sunday night at the 56th annual Grammys. Their album, Random Access Memories, picked up three honors for album, album of the Year, Best Dance and Electronica Album, and Engineered Album. And their single with Pharrell Williams and Nile Rodgers' Get Lucky was named Record of the Year and Best Pop Duo Group Performance. It was the first time a primary electronic group album took the top honor. Lord and the 17-year-old New Zealander girls hit Royals, won both Song of the Year, she's the youngest artist to ever receive a win in that category, and Best Pop Solo Performance. Macklemore and Ryan Lewis also took their first Grammys by storm. Hip Hop Duo was named Best New Artist, and they also won three major rap awards, Best Performance and Best Song for Thrift, Thrift Shop, and Best Album for The Heist. During their performance of Same Love, guested by Madonna, a group of 30 couples exchanged marriage vows in the audience. Today's trivia question, everyone on your mark, who won the first Grammy for Album of the Year? Year? What year was it? Shubs, can we give him what? 1959. Uh, Buddy Holly. Grammy for Album of the Year, 1959. Four tops. Boo, boo, boo. Anyone else want to take a guess? No? In 1959, the music from Peter Gunn by Henry Mancini, the soundtrack to the TV series P Peter Gunn, took the top honor. The main theme is notable for its combination of jazz orchestration with a straightforward rock and roll backbeat. The music from Peter Gunn was selected by the Library of Congress as a 2010 addition to the National Recording Registry, which selects recordings annually that are culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. That wraps it up for today's editorial headlines. We're going to send it over to my main man, Brent Slava, here, who's going to give us rating changes ahead of the bell. Thanks a lot, Joe. You got it, buddy. That was a uh, pretty good trivia tidbit. Yeah. I'm not sure. I wasn't watching the chat there. Did anyone have a response? Yeah, we had one guest for Elvis over here. One guest for Elvis. One yeah, guest. Jerry well. was on the Beatles, though. I think you're a little bit early, though. I think the Beatles a little said early. a little early on that. All right, so let me uh, profile a couple of the top upgrades and downgrades for this morning. Looks like we have a few more notable downgrades this morning. Uh, let's start with the upgrades, though. JMP upgrading shares of E-Trade from market perform to market outperform this morning. Raymond James upgrading shares of Potash from market perform to outperform, boosting the price target there on Potash to 37 bucks. Bank of America upgrading shares of Peabody from underperform to neutral. Merck getting upgrade from Morgan Stanley. It looks like a couple notch upgrade here. This is notable. Merck now rated with an overweight rating. Morgan Stanley previously had an underweight rating. Also, Morgan Stanley setting a $60 price target on shares of Merck. Buckingham Research upgrading shares of Kansas City Southern KSU is the ticker there from underperform to neutral. And then Barclays making a call 
Let's see, let me find my other couple here. Barclays making a call on some of the home builders this morning. Upgrading shares of Meritage, that is Mike Tango Hotel, from equal weight to overweight, while at the same time downgrading shares of both Toll Brothers and KB Homes. Toll downgraded to equal weight, while KB Home downgraded from equal weight to underweight. Barclays apparently thinking KB Homes is sort of the laggard in that space. Uh, one more on the upgrade side of things. Ladenburg Thalman upgrading shares of Honeywell from hold to buy. For the top downgrades this morning, JMP downgrading shares of Sarepta, Sandy Romeo, Papa, Tango to market perform. CSX getting a downgrade over at Atlantic Equities from now rating that stock with a neutral rating. Guggenheim downgrading shares of Conoco Phillips, Charlie Oscar Papa from buy to hold. And then getting back to Barclays firm also downgrading shares of Mosaic this morning. Barclays now rates Mosaic with an equal equal weight rating. That is so difficult to say. Equal weight rating. Um, and then a little bit of a, a analyst conflict here. We got um, I mentioned Buckingham upgrading shares of Kansas City Southern. Also have some action over at Raymond James this morning. They downgraded the stock albeit to a bullish rating. Raymond James downgrading KSU from strong buy to outperform there, lowering the price target to 109. Bank of America downgrading shares of Mercado Libre ticker there is Mali Mike Echo Lima India from neutral to underperform, and then two more top downgrades. These are the more notable ones. We have Janie Capital downgrading shares of Lululemon this morning Ooh. from buy to neutral. They slashed the price target from 61 bucks to 49 bucks. Joel, you got a little excited on that one. You want to take a look at the chart real quick? Oh, man. We haven't talked about Lulu in a while. Not man. really, no. It's just, they've just been having major problems uh, heading down here. And now it uh, looked like it was trying to put a bottom in here a few days ago. And uh, it is just struggling here, kind of. Kind of like my computer here, trying to <laughs> pull up the symbol here. Come on, Lulu. Come on, man. I tell you, we got to get off this dial-up uh, connection here. <laughs> trying. No, we don't have we don't have dial-up. That was a joke. Okay. Uh, trying. I mean, you can say it's. Can, I mean, this is a daily chart on this, so you could say that it's making a similar formation here. You know, where it just kind of consolidated mm -hmm. and had tight ranges. And then you could have thought, well, hey, it's finally bottomed, but it's just doing the same thing here. Right. Uh, several lows, 46 and a half, 46.35, and then Friday didn't quite get there. I guess if you're trying for a swing trade here, you know, a buck, buck and a quarter off the lows, you can, you know, give it a try. But, uh, you know, the downgrade is certainly not going to help things. So we're right around 4720 yeah. pre-market action. There was that pop over 47 bucks uh, midday on Friday. I'm looking at the pro feed. I don't remember if we noted any reason related to that pop, but a uh, number of the other footwear guys were also moving. Uh, Deckers and then Ralph Lauren also moving on the apparel side of things. So maybe just a little bit of profit taken. Not sure on that one. We can dive into that one a little bit later. And then uh, the last ringer that I had saved here for you, Joel, was a downgrade on Cisco from J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan saying the equivalent of sell on Cisco. They really? downgraded it from neutral to underweight. They also cut the price target from 21 bucks down to 17 bucks. Wow. And we got Cisco shares trading around 2171. Thank you, sir. So, wow, I see the last print there. They even had it much lower. This is a big 2130 move. 2130 was yeah. the pre-market low. Yeah, that's a big that's a huge move for, for Cisco. Cisco. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking for this thing to recover here, it looks like uh, someone really has a foot on it here at the $2180 level. Uh, if in fact you can get back above 2180 here, try to sneak back into yesterday's range. The low uh, was uh, 2217 and 2220. So um, also, if you're looking at the support levels here, you did have a couple lows under 22, three right at the 22 dollar level. That's where we're holding here. So. Uh, Let's see, get back above 2180. I think we can sneak back into the 22 handle. 
this uh, 2170, 2180 level doesn't hold up. You had, what would you say was a pre-market low? 2131? 2130 on the button, I see. Seems like they're, they're hitting this thing kind of hard, but uh, we'll see how it reacts off the open. So I did just click into that JP Morgan note. Looks more or less like a valuation call. I say valuation is rich compared to earnings potential. Um, let's see, emerging markets, emerging markets potential weakness. Specifically in the services sector, looks like JP Morgan was concerned on Cisco. And then they also cited some delayed spending in the switching space. Also as another negative there for Cisco. Let me see, we also do have a couple new a couple notable notable new coverages this morning that is for firms initiating coverage for the first time on a stock we have JP Morgan initiating coverage on a couple of the footwear names here Foot Locker with an overweight rating and forty seven dollar target and then finish line with a neutral rating and twenty eight dollar target or those are from JP Morgan and then we do have a quiet period which is expiring today on AMC Entertainment that is a recent IPO Alpha Mike Charlie is the ticker there there is AMC Networks that has been trading on the, I believe the Nasdaq for some time that one is AMC X and that is kinda like uh, the network um, uh, what's the word the network media for AMC AMC Entertainment AMC ticker is like the actual theaters that you or I would go to so AMC getting let's see one two three I see it at least three by equivalent ratings. We had FBR with an outperform rating and twenty-seven dollar price target on AMC. We have a new buy rating at Stiefel Nicholas. We have a new outperform rating at Piper Jeffrey and then B. Riley and Co. is kind of the uh the party pooper there on AMC. They're starting coverage with a neutral neutral rating. And this is this is pretty much the heart of the earnings season this week. We're gonna get some of the most exciting earnings reports out. Let me see if I can just really quickly go through a few of the notable ones. We're going to get Google after the close on, it looks like, Thursday. We're going to get Apple tonight, as Dennis was mentioning a little bit earlier. Usually Apple is out right before 4.30. I don't know if I, if I had to place a minute on it, it'd be around uh, 4.27, 4.28-ish. So tune in to the feed around then. Also going to get results out of Seagate, out of U.S. Steel. We did have Caterpillar this morning. We did have Royal Caribbean a little bit earlier. Um, looks like we're going to have a couple of the uh, steel guys here. We're going to have uh, also Steel Dynamics is going to be reporting this week. Um, but that was just a few of the highlights. We do have a busy earnings week scheduled for the news desk. So tune in at 4 to the, wire, to the news wire if you want to see some of the excitement that goes on related to earnings. I think that about covers it for me. I'm going to pass this one over to Shaky Jake the Snake. He's the guy I want to talk to. Yeah, it is. Uh, just taking a look here uh, first before Jake pops on here. Uh, the Caterpillar uh, bus blowing away earnings here. 92 bucks and doesn't really seem to be given much back here. Uh, let's just take a look at the pre-market high. Cat, we are right there right now. This thing back over the $92 level. I guess the only only level we can give you here uh, is yet a couple highs. One at uh, 92.86 on the 16th, and then you had a high at 93.20. So uh, a lot of upward momentum here in the cat. Jake, how you doing today? Ah, uh, not too bad, not too bad. Uh, you know, just kind of getting the uh, the week started here. Right, right. Uh, yeah, you, you were just talking about Caterpillar there. Uh, so you had, uh, have you looked at John Deere yet? Uh, or Deere, Deere and Company? Because they were rallying this morning up almost 2%, uh, broke above a uh, whole, whole dollar level, uh, possibly heading towards 90 bucks. I don't know. Um, showing a little strength on this uh, this Caterpillar report. Yeah, we were, were talking that uh, on a relative basis, it's, you know, it's trading up with it. Uh, looking at uh, Friday's high, hasn't quite gotten through Friday's high yet, so that's a little, a little concerning here. Uh, it's close. You had Friday's high at 87.67. Let's see if you were able to pop above it in the, right there. Just, I mean, for right now, it's opening into resistance, I'd say, in the dare. Yeah, so we definitely wanted to take a look at that one, uh, showing a lot of strength, especially since we don't have, you know, there was a lot of uh, weakness in China predicted by short sellers like Jim Chanos, 
and yet you know we saw that 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 beat from Caterpillar so it's kind of proven them wrong there another one we'll take a look at that is news driven here is Millennial Media the ticker there is Mike Mike company raised its revenue guidance for the fourth quarter this morning and really kind of sent it through the roof. The company is looking for, uh, originally they were looking for $100 million at the top end of their expected revenue, and now they're looking, uh, let's see, uh, putting that below their uh, their new range, new range I think it was like 106 to $109 million. So uh, a really big rally there. They were up as much as 19% this morning. Uh, Joel, what do you think of Millennial Media here? I mean, like, basically up a, a whole buck here. Uh, I'm thinking that I got a 3M chart here to look at. So, uh, uh, I have to go. Uh, have to go on your one on, on that one. <laughs> All right. So we do. We do have a lot of strength shown here. So I want to keep an eye on Millennial Media for uh, today's report. Um, yeah, you know, so they had uh, they're guiding Q4 sales 106 to 109 million. The street was looking for 89 million. So huge bump over the street expectations. Although the company had already raised its own expectations. So keep an eye on Millennial Media on today's session. Um, another one that we did uh, see moving this morning, and uh, you know, Joel, I, I don't know if you've got anything. It's on, it's called Quicksilver Resources. I saw them moving a lot in the pre-market. I, I don't know if it was somebody that just decided to buy shares at kind of the wrong time or whatever, or I mean, sell. I mean, it, it's down over four percent right now. Uh, Kilo Whiskey Kilo is the uh, is the company here. We didn't really see a whole lot of news on the wires on it, but it's really getting uh, offered down. Joel, I don't know if you had any thoughts on this chart here. Uh, you know, it's one of those obscure names, but they are uh, they are moving to the downside, and you know it's. Um, was it about half a billion dollar market cap company? So uh, smaller, smaller company, but it is uh, moving in the pre market today. Uh set so, yeah. Looking at this thing, it uh, it closed it closed week seven twelve uh, low seven thirteen close. Haven't had a lot of trades and it had a real bad day on Friday. Not getting uh, any kind of pop up here with the market. Uh, this stock is just having a really a hard time. Uh, you know, getting its its footing. I'd have to, you know, if it just continues down to the seven dollar level here, or wait, K K W K, right? Yep. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know why that other one came up there. May had three tops in a row over the three dollar level, right at uh, three and a quarter, three twenty. We're a ways away from that now. I uh, did have the lows at three oh seven, kind of trading below that. If uh, if it, I see a trade. 229 that just might be a bad trade because then you pop back right back up at 308 but uh keep an eye on these three lows here if you get a chance to short it above the three dollar level especially with that that uh 1700 share print there at 229 we did uh you know this morning we did have caterpillar earnings we went over but another one i want to take a look at is royal caribbean you know i'm always kind of uh you know hating on cat on uh, carnival whenever i get a chance here but royal caribbean did come through with a beat this morning uh eps came in at 23 cents which expected 18 cents so uh, we had a nice strong beat there so it's rcl's ticker romeo charlie lima for anyone looking at their own charts uh while they're watching the show uh joel what are you thinking of uh, royal caribbean here i mean uh, it's, it's up almost four percent in the pre-market here. Maybe it's even eyeing that fifty-dollar level. It did. It did pop over fifty uh, right when the the initial spike. It came up, got up at the fifty uh, fifty sixteen. Uh, that's gonna be a tough level for it to deal with today. Uh, also had a low on the fifteenth at fifty twenty-four here. You've backed off, you know, almost a dollar and a half from that level. So I think uh, even if you get near the 50, I think people will just uh, take an opportunity here to uh, take some profits. And then also Dennis uh, pointed out here on a longer term chart that this stock, uh, if you go back in 2011, I believe, uh, it sniffed the $50 level again and then got cut in half. So uh, returning to a multi-year high here, uh, you know, almost uh, almost a three-year high. Let's see if uh, people take the opportunity here to take some chips off the table. Definitely want to take a look at, uh, you know, keep, keep an eye on that in today's session. Uh, another one that we had uh, this morning was uh, Roper Industries, uh, which is Romeo, Oscar, Papa. Uh, EPS came in at $1.65 versus $1.60 expected. 
while revenues came in at 889.2 million for expected 881.3 uh, 3 million. So uh, beat on the top and beat on the bottom line. We had a, a lot of strength in the uh, the earnings reports this morning, both on top and bottom lines. Uh, so shares are, don't seem to be trading a whole lot right now. Uh, Joel, any any thoughts on this one before the uh, the market opens up? Ah, uh, nope. This is another tough one for uh, for my software here. Uh, ROP, you said. Yep. I uh, don't know if you had a chance to take a look at that, but it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on in the pre-market with it today, But uh, yeah, which obviously means we'll get a little bit of action at the open. So um, we are actually nearing the market open right now, 929 is what I'm seeing. So, Joel, any thoughts of the S&Ps before we, uh, before we get the party started? Yeah, kind of a slow leak here. Uh, I got up to 1792, kind of been peeling back uh, since uh, since we've made that high here. Uh, Caterpillar definitely a, a boost uh, to you know to the market. They taken that good news up, but uh, melted here five points off the high here. So uh, really need to sneak back into that 1790 handle pretty quickly. Or I'm looking at us uh, to get back down to the low and the close at uh, 81 and a quarter low, 81 and a half uh, was the close. Uh, below that you had the pre-market low of 76 and a quarter, but uh, not a not a lot of uh, not a lot of activity here off the open. The S and P's just did open. I'd really I want to see if this cat is open yet because that is just that's got to be the move the move of the morning. What you say, Jake? I I would absolutely say so. I mean, with that ten billion dollar buyback, one point seven of which is expected to be in that first quarter, beating on the top, beating on the bottom line, especially after you know all the warnings from Caterpillar and so many. Uh, you know, big names out there kind of saying that, all right, you know, the company is going to be hurting in the near future because of China. Uh, they seem to really be proving everybody wrong here. Uh, seem to open up just shy of that $92 level. Uh, let's see what the uh, what the session high is so far. Uh, made a high 91.86, a low at 90.80, currently trading 91.60. So, uh, you know, trying to, trying to, hold that resistance at 92 92.16 pre-market high so we'll see needs to get back that you know above 92 to continue this incredible move and then uh, you were looking for the sympathy move in uh, shares of uh, John Deere uh, that was unable even to trade up through yesterday's high in the pre-market uh, let's see not much of a pop at all here uh, very very muted reaction here Stock is trading up, but uh, nowhere near where it was trading in the pre-market. So, uh, not reacting well. The deer not reacting to the cat news. Well, if we want to take a look at, a, at one of those other stocks that's been trading all over the place recently, is Aria. That's Aria Pharmaceuticals, Alpha oh, yeah. Romeo India Alpha. And this is one that's you know completely rumor-driven about whether or not it's going to be acquired. So one day it may be up 15%, another day it may be down 20%. Uh, today, I guess it's decided to be up almost six. Um, so uh. while this one is completely you know fueled on whatever rumor is dominating that day. Once that rumor's on the street, it's a matter of you know following the trading action. So, Joel, what do you think of this one? I mean, this is obviously just a huge trading vehicle for the street right now. You know, it's it's very you know it basically has a catalyst one way or another during a day, and then you know it's off to the races for the traders. I uh, had a looking at uh, the the resistance that you have from uh, Friday 983, and then today's high 970 here. So I think you know things are starting to tighten up a little bit. Had a good day on Friday. I think that was an upgrade or whatever, but uh, really like to see a move, uh, you know, above that Friday's high 983, or you might see a little bit of profit taking in the issue. So I want to keep an eye on that. Another one I know uh, Brent did bring up that Cisco downgrade earlier. You know, that kind of oh, yeah. that kind of caught me off guard a little bit. So I I want to bring up that chart. That's uh, Charlie Sandy, Charlie Oscar. For anyone following along on their own charts. It's only down about 0.6% right now, not managing to break below that $22 level. I know it did in the pre-market briefly, but now it looks like it's kind of recovered a little bit. Joel, do you think people are using this as a buying opportunity, yeah. or you think that's kind of what's going on here? Well, that's what it looks like. I mean, they really beat it up in the pre-market, and uh, I don't know how in the heck they got it down to 2130. But uh, you did have some lows uh, in the daily chart under the $22 level. You've snuck under there, made a low 21.76. Now trying to hold above 22. 
I think you get back uh, up in the yesterday's range, 22.17 low, 22 closed. Uh, I mean, if uh, you know, if you took this home long and then you see the downgrade, it gets back up to the low of the close, your mark here. Uh, you know, a lot of people be looking to get out. Uh, coming back down here, I think uh, people that missed the buy under 22 will be taking shots ahead of uh, this 21.76 level. And, uh, you know, it's funny, didn't didn't Juniper have good numbers the other day? Yeah, they did, actually. Yeah. I, I can pull those up for you if you're, real quick if, you, if you'd like. Uh, but, yeah, Ju uh, Juniper, that's uh, Juliet November, Papa Romeo, for anyone that wants to kind of uh, hop in on that one uh, with us. The uh, I'll get, get those numbers real quick. Yeah, but, uh, and um, they also had an activist investor, I think, getting involved with it, too, right? Someone took a big stake. Yeah, actually, I guess it, the numbers weren't that strong. 30 cents versus a 37 cent estimate. Uh, revenues came in at 1.27 billion versus expected 1.22, so it looks like they missed on the bottom but beat on the top. And then their guidance wasn't actually that great. Uh, their EPS for the first quarter, they guided 27 to 30 cents. The street was looking for 29. Uh, but it looks like they guided their revenue up slightly above street expectations. So it looks like it's kind of a mixed report there. Uh, but I think it was Deanna Partners or somebody was taking a big stake, a big activist stake. Elliot. Elliot, Elliot hey. Management, yep, okay. Brent, Brent okay. just called it in there. Okay, uh, looking at this one here, uh, 27.55 was the low that you had on Friday. You've hit 27.65 in uh, the session so far today. I think as long as it holds above that Friday's low here, you may get a chance to uh, sneak back into the 28 handle. But uh, when you see a big move up like this, and then the next day you get a muted follow through, I don't know. Kind of gave you a gift on Friday. I wouldn't like to see it take out that Friday's low at uh, 27.55. Let's just take a quick look at the S&Ps here. Continuing south here, uh, people took the opportunity to take some profits there in the pre-market. Uh, still four points away from coming down to uh, you know yesterday's low and close. I think that would be some excellent excellent support uh we are trading mid-range on the session here so if you did get a short off there in the high 1780s or low 1790s here uh mid-range here on the day it's 1784 even and we have a session low or intraday session low here right right at that level 1784.50 so one uh one thing I kind of want to take a look at is some of the names that we're having it uh, report after the close. Oh, you know, yeah. we know Apple's coming in, we know Seagate's coming in, we also have U.S. Steel coming in. So a lot, a lot of big names coming in after the close here. So I figured we kind of uh, hop into a few of those and just kind of get your outlook on you know maybe not necessarily what you're thinking for the earnings report, but at least we were looking at, at the price action. So I don't know, you want to get started with uh, the biggest of them all, which is Apple. Okay. All right, uh, let's take a look at the big gun here. Uh, Carl was sure at it uh, all week last week. Oh, huh? man, he was really going for it. He's looking for probably like a 100-point up move <laughs> off these earnings or something, right? It must be uh, with the, with the, way, the way he talks it up. Uh, position squaring here, uh, three highs, right, that 555 to 557 level. Uh, you did get the 554.80 here, the quick bounce here, so... I'd, I'd be surprised if it could take out that, that 557.29 today. I just think people kind of be lightening up ahead of earnings. And then uh, Dennis made a point there. Uh, you had uh, a low on uh, Friday at 44.75. You had a low on Thursday at 44.80. So you almost had identical ranges in the issue from uh, Thursday and Friday. So, hey, play the ranges today in Apple ahead of earnings. Definitely want to, uh, you know, look into that. Uh, Joel, what are you thinking for Seagate? You know, we've seen Western Digital, right? Uh, we saw that one come in, and I'm just kind of wondering if Seagate's going to be able to kind of pull off a similar thing. I'll pull up uh, Western Digital's numbers here. Seagate is uh, STX for anyone wanting to oh. take a look at their their own charts or uh, Sandy it, Tango X-Ray. Uh, it used to be SEG. <laughs> it used to be. They yep. Pull the switcheroo on me here. Absolutely. So I don't know if you want to hop into that one, what you're thinking there. I'll, I'll grab those Western Dig numbers and we can kind of, uh, you know, compare them. Uh, Seagate sitting on some support here, uh, not getting a bounce with the market. 58.46, you're low on Friday. Currently have taken that out at 58.32. Really going to need to get away from this area very quickly here to uh, get back at high, way over 60. So I don't think you're going to see that today. 
Um, also had another low at this area on the 13th, 58.39. So better hold in here. You could find yourself in Seagate under the $58 level. Uh, closer to, you had a 57.70 low and a 57. 56 low so call hold that area you know 57 65 here but doesn't look like it's uh holding the low or the support off the open you know see it's having trouble there and i'm looking at uh western digital and in, in our in our calendar platform and they have not missed on the top or bottom line in the last is it eight reports yeah, they just don't miss, and they just keep beating. Uh, their most recent report, 219 versus uh, the 207 expected, while revenues came in at 3.97 billion versus expected 3.84 billion. Oh, and they also, I guess their guidance wasn't so hot, but they just don't seem to miss expectations. It's so that's uh, pretty impressive here. How did you find such a good chart here? Look <laughs> at all these lows here. At uh, uh, right here, you're looking at uh, the low from uh, Thursday. Or excuse me, some Friday at 84.99 with the 85 close. He came right down to that level and today's session made 85 low. So it's come down here a few other times um, in the middle of the month. So holds 85 could easily uh, turn turn around, go back up. Uh, perhaps test yesterday's, or excuse me, now Friday size quite a ways away. But uh, needs to hold 85 here. It looks like it's uh, making a good attempt at it so far. So another name that was uh, on the downside of my scanners this morning was Solar City. Uh, it wasn't trading down a ton. I think it wasn't down a whole lot more than one percent. Up, oh, it's in the green now. So uh, Solar City, you know, m making a recovery here. Uh, Sandy, Charlie, Tango, Yankee, you know, one of the super volatile names out there. I feel like we haven't really talked about it a ton recently. Joel, any thoughts on uh, Solar City? Uh, Solar City was the one that uh, the uh, got the Goldman upgrade, while uh, mm -hmm. First Solar got the downgrade here. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> came back, um, you know, sold off, but looks like we're holding in here at Friday's low, 69.21. Made a low at 69 and a quarter. We're almost two bucks away from that. Uh, that also fills the gap, I believe, from when uh, Goldman did that action. So doesn't look like you're going to get a shot to buy here again in the low 69s today, unless the market really turns around. Uh, no major resistance until Friday's high at 72.91. So here's another one that's actually been showing a lot of strength recently. It's Walter Energy Whiskey Lang <laughs> Whiskey Lima Tango. I almost said Lango. Uh, yeah, do doing doing great over here on this Monday morning. Uh, so Walter Energy, uh, it's it, it's been kind of rallying all last week. It looks like it maybe even uh, close to 12.50 now, up about one percent this morning. Not a whole lot of news, but sometimes these coal names will just you know pick a direction and go for it. Uh, Joel, do you see anything on the chart here? Um, last my charge run, this thing's back at 11.50. I'm seeing the, I guess, 11.46 yeah. or so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we are trading right in the vicinity. You had a low on Friday at 11.24. Hit a low today at 11.36. So potential double bottom here. I mean, it's uh, from a swing trade perspective, you're trying to pick a bottom here. So if you want to rely on Friday's low here, uh, you know, you can use that. Uh, coming back on the upside, I'm sure it's going to have uh, trouble with the $12 level. Uh, 12.10 was your high on Friday. I do want to take a look at Carnival as well. We did have those Royal Caribbean earnings this morning, and Carnival's behaving exactly how I'd expect it, up about 2.4%. Uh, you know, I guess, you know, Royal Caribbean isn't crashing, and, you know, we haven't gotten any uh, bad reports out of Carnival in quite a while, so maybe they're getting their act together. 40.18 high on Friday and 40.21 high in today's session here. So opening up, can't take out that resistance yet. So that's if you're if you're a bull here in uh, Carnival, you want to see this thing printing 40 and a quarter, 40.30, uh, get a chance to sprint back up to the $41 level. And uh, let's look take a look too. Uh, Jake, good bringing back all these stocks that we talked about here. Uh, fifty dollars in the pre-market. Nope, you haven't even got a shot near that. Forty-nine nineteen has been the high, and uh, let's see what the cat is doing. Uh, the cat was hanging out. That's still that ninety-two dollar level. Finding plenty of sellers here. Did get up to ninety-two thirty-one. Uh, came to come back down under ninety-two. Uh, had to high ninety-two eighty-six. I tell you though, I I am surprised that it's like held up. 
you know, above 92 for this long here. So, uh, cat hanging in there. Yep, you know, we've got uh, you know, commodities taking kind of a hit, too. You know, crude oil and both and gold are both down, while the euro dollar is down as well. So, I mean, that could just be because the markets are rising right now. I just kind of wanted to take a look at that. Joel, we're kind of running out of time here, so I figured we'd get kind of your take on the S&Ps and you know, today's session real quick and make sure that we uh, knock that out. Okay, all right. Let's just go back to the S&Ps. S&P futures here, uh, you did get the sell-off uh, to mid-range here, 1784. I uh, did get a little pop back up, snuck into the 1790 handle. Uh, I just don't think it'll be a big reversal day until we can clear that pre-market high at 1792. Uh, coming back on the downside, 1784 and a half, the intraday low, it could be buffeted. You got the low and the close from Friday, 81 and a quarter, 81 and a half, and that'd be another support level. So looks like, you know, you didn't have the big whoosh down overnight. Market's kind of, you know, holding in here and, uh, trying to do that reversal so jake thanks for uh, chiming in with all those stocks uh enjoy the rest of your trading day and we'll be back with you tomorrow